Hey, what's up guys? We are currently here in Lake Observatory on top of Mount Hamilton. The near city is here, San Jose, which is a couple like 20 miles from here. This observatory is named after James Lick, one of the uh, early people who resided in the Bay Area. And uh, it's currently under the University of California. Okay, let's check it out inside. Shortly before his death in 1876, James Lake, one of the state's wealthiest citizens and originally a carpenter and piano maker, designated $700,000 for the construction of a telescope superior to and more powerful than any yet made. Lake's deed of trust did not spell out the details of the new observatory, leaving the board of trust a great responsibility carrying out his wishes. Its president was Captain Richard S. Floyd. Floyd had met Lick in 1874 through Lick's homestead foreman Thomas Fraser. Floyd and Fraser joined forces and they gave shape to Lick's dream. However, neither of them possessed the specialized knowledge needed to build the observatory. Thus, advice was sought from the great astronomical centers on the East Coast and in Europe. The famous astronomer Simon Newcomb of the U.S. Naval Observatory was elected as scientific advisor. Newcomb and Floyd traveled to Europe to meet with the most prominent astronomers and telescope builders of the time. Refractor Crucial decisions needed to be made before work could begin. Among them was the choice of telescope design. Newcomb, Floyd, and the board members found themselves in the middle of the rapidly heating debate over the comparative merits of refracting and reflecting telescopes. Refractors has been the choice of most astronomers since the invention of the telescope, yet reflectors were gaining acceptance as mirror-making materials and techniques improved. Some already saw the reflector as the telescope of the future. In the end, the board member chose the more conservative path, building what remains today the world's second largest refractor. The Cleveland firm of Warner and Swayze built a telescope tube, its mount and the machinery to operate it. Union Ironworks of San Francisco constructed a huge dome. The figuring of the lenses was entrusted to the optical firm of Alvin Graham of Clark and Sons of Massachusetts. The glass discs for the lenses were to be made by Charles Fail in Paris, the only firm capable of the required size and quality. The latter's production would ultimately cause years of delay. Mountain Top Observatory Beginning in 1874, Lake's Board of Trust began work on the selection of the best possible site for the observatory. Today, Telescopes are located on mountain tops, but at the time of Lake, observatories were typically built in cities. Lake had originally envisioned his observatory in San Francisco. However, cities had become increasingly inhospitable as outdoor street lights became common and smoke pollution grew. Aware of these problems, the Board of Trust scouted mountain top sites for the new telescope. Numerous sites were considered, including the shores of Lake Tahoe, Mount St. Helena in Sonoma County, and various prominent peaks in the San Francisco Bay Area. Finally, in 1875, Lake's foreman Thomas Fraser suggested Mount Hamilton. Nestled in the Diablo Range to the east of San Jose, it is the highest point within a radius of some 85 miles. Its summit had been a familiar sight from Lake's ranch, so Lake approved of the choice ending the long search for the site. Thus, Dick Observatory became the first permanently occupied mountain top observatory in the world. Virtually, all others have since followed suit. However, not even a trail led up Mount Hamilton, so a first-class road to the summit was funded by the Santa Clara County, a prominent scientific facility promised considerable prestige for the agricultural county they undertake the project at the cost of $70,000. The federal and state governments granted approximately 2,500 acres around, and 
and including the top of Mount Hamilton to the Board of Trust. The road which came to be called Lick Avenue, now Mount Hamilton Road, was completed in 1876. In 1879, the Board of Trust hired S.W. Burnham, an accomplished double star observer, to test observing conditions on Mount Hamilton. He visited the mountain in late summer and early fall, the best months for observing. Construction begins. Lake chose John Wright of San Francisco's Wright and Sanders firm of architects to design both the observatory and the astronomer's house on classical revival style. All of the construction materials had to be brought to the site by horse and mule drawn wagons, which could not negotiate a steep grade. The road had to take a very winding and sinuous path. Tradition maintains that this road has exactly 365 turns. The actual work of building began in 1880, headed by Captain Floyd with Thomas Fraser as superintendent. Work began with the leveling of the mountain top. Construction of the main building was simplified when a bed of fine clay was unearthed about a mile from the summit. Kilns were built near the deposit, and more than 3 million bricks were fired. Also, a discovery of spring near the summit provided much needed water for drinking and water power. The plan for the main building called for two domes, a larger of which would house the great refractor connected by a long hallway flanked by offices, laboratories, and a library. By 1881, the small dome was completed and a 12-inch telescope installed. From the side of the 12-inch dome, the long central hallway of the building began to emerge, advancing southward along the summit as construction progressed, finally reaching the point where it was to meet the 36-inch dome. And there, it's told, at the House of Fail in Paris, one of the discs of glass that would be used to make the giant lens had been accidentally broken during shipment. Success in reproducing the broken element proved elusive, and without the glass, the clerks could not estimate the final focal length, without which the final length of the telescope could not be determined. With the length of the telescope unknown, construction of its dome could not begin. First light. Months of waiting turned into years, but finally, late 1885, after 18 failed attempts, a suitable piece of glass was on its way to Boston. A year later, the largest lens ever made crossed the continent on a specially designed railroad car, making the last leg of the journey by horse and wagon, arriving safely on the summit two days after Christmas 1886. With the lenses on hand, construction of the Great Dome finally begun. Lick's funeral ten years earlier had been as grand as that for any head of state, but early in January 1887, in accordance with his wishes, and at appropriate stage in the construction, James Lick was brought for the first time to the summit of Mount Hamilton and laid to rest, for the last time, at the base of the pier hidden from sight beneath the floor of his great telescope. Then, on a bitterly cold January night in 1888, the telescope saw first light. Stormy weather prevented observing until that night. A break in the clouds provided the first chance to put the nearly 15 years of planning and hard work to the test. One can only imagine the shock and distress they might have felt when they could not focus the telescope until it was discovered that an error in the estimate of the focal length had caused the tube to be built too long. A hacksaw was sent for and the tube shortened. The image of the blazing red sun, the bright star Alvedran, came into focus. It was the Earth's largest refracting telescope during the period, until 1897. Sadly, Floyd's triumph was diluted by illness and disappointment, chronic heart disease, and bitterness over unfounded criticism of Floyd and the telescope in the San Francisco press were taking their toll. Less than three years later, Floyd died at the age of 47. The Observatory Moving Forward E. E. Bernard used the telescope in 1892 to discover the fifth moon of Jupiter, Amaltea, 
It was the first addition to Jupiter's known moons since Galileo observed the planet through his parchment tube and spectacle lens. In the 1930s, its mirror was one of the first large mirrors to be luminized. Although associated since the beginning of its operation with the University of California, the Lick Observatory was at first an autonomous facility. In May 1888, the observatory was turned over to the regents of the University of California. When James Keeler became its director in 1898, the observatory strengthened academic ties with the University of California's Berkeley campus by arranging to have its staff teach there. Although it benefited from a presence of several young and highly promising astronomers, it also experienced continued pressure from the Berkeley campus to disband the resident staff and turn the facility into an observing station for the growing university system. In 1928, Donald D. Shane studied carbon stars here and was able to distinguish them into spectral classes. On May 1939, during a nighttime fog, a U.S. Army Air Force two-seater attack plane crashed into the main building. Nothing caught fire and the two individuals in the building were unharmed, but the passengers were killed instantly. After the war, as American astronomy became more campus-based, Lick was one of the last major observatories to lose its autonomy, coming under full university control in the mid-1960s. With the growth of San Jose and the rest of the Silicon Valley, light pollution became a problem for the observatory. In the 70s, a site in the Santa Lucia Mountains, southeast of Monterey, was evaluated for possible relocation. However, funding for the move was not available. In 1980, San Jose began a program to reduce the effects of lighting, most notably replacing all street lamps with sodium lamps and it helped. The International Astronomical Union named Asteroid 6216 San Jose to honor the city's efforts toward reducing light pollution. In 2006, the little town of Mount Hamilton has about 23 families in residence, plus about 2 to 10 visiting astronomers from the university campuses. In 2013, one of Lick Observatory's key funding sources was scheduled for elimination in 2018. But the following year, the University of California announced its intention to continue to support the observatory. In 2015, the company Google donated $1 million to the observatory over two years. Guys, I hope you learned something from Leak Observatory. Until next time, bye! So guys, if you like our videos, please subscribe to our channel and feel free to comment. Hit the bell, hit the bell, hit the bell, hit the bell, come on guys, hit the bell! For notifications! And don't forget to share! Hello!